first action recognition workshops. Uh, it's on uh, action recognition with a large number of classes. And the title is uh, TUMOS 2013. So the first question that everyone asks us is, <coughs> what is this TUMOS thing? Um, and so TUMOS is actually a Greek word. Uh, it expresses the notion of this kind of competitive or radical spirit as in a spirit of context. context. Um, however, the word is also used to express this human desire for recognition. Now, I'm sure that when the Greeks came up with the word, they did have action recognition in mind. They just had to wait a very long time for uh, to come up with it. But, um, but the idea is that we wanted this to be a workshop as well as a contest where people could try out their techniques on uh, large-scale human action recognition, especially now that the new data sets that we have are, uh, are many more classes than something like ADA. So for those of uh, those people in the audience who uh, might not be familiar with uh, large scale action, we'll give a quick opening before we hand over to our congrats speaker. Um, before that, however, I do want to thank the organizers, in particular the people who did a lot of the hard work, Yugang and uh, Jingan here, but Amir, uh, for visa reasons, unfortunately, be here, and he actually sacrificed the most. He actually delayed his PhD thesis dissertation so that he could, you know, focus on getting all this done. So that's actually a high level of uh, dedication to the workshop. And of course, I would like to thank my uh, my co-chairs, Mubarak and Ivan and Massimo here. So for all the hard work putting this together. So action recognition in the in the old days. Action recognition with large numbers of classes meant something like six. You know, there were, uh, there were interesting actions that were done primarily by researchers in staged environments. And uh, that's because there weren't that many data sets available, and there weren't actually that many videos available on the internet. If you look at the old, uh, old websites, it says things like, we can't make the data set available to too big, email the organizers, and we'll send you a hard disk, things like that. And, um, and over, over the years, uh, it went from six to 10 actions, and actions in Flutter, <coughs> where people are trying to do localization, as well as, uh, as well as whole clip recognition. And then I think a shift happened, because then once people digitized uh, movies, videos, people started seeing, uh, <coughs> seeing the possibility of doing action recognition in existing, existing videos. Starting with small numbers of actions like the uh, drinking and smoking, moving on to Hollywood action, which still yeah, gets used with uh, everyday actions, and then uh, with sports. So this is, the, I guess, the start of the UCF series of uh, data sets, which in this case was collected by Sada Lee um, and Mikhail, along with uh, their interns. On, uh, and these were sports actions collected from professional footage. However, going from this professional footage to um, user-generated content, I think was a big shift because instead of having well-framed, cinematographically interesting shots, we just had random videos of dogs and cats and people doing silly things on YouTube. And uh, UCF 11 was the first one to really popularize that. And uh, based on that success, uh, UCF went on to generate the UCF 50 data set, which is being uh, very popular these days in the action recognition community. Uh, collecting this kind of data is uh, very non-trivial, particularly when uh, the training set has to be temporally segmented. So a lot of lot of downloading from YouTube and temporal segmentation making it available. And of course, in the last year or so, there's been uh, last couple of years there's been even more. And so HMDB and UCF 101 are the current data sets that people have been using. And this workshop is focused particularly on uh, on UCF 101, which was just released uh, uh, late last year. Um, through the hard work of Amir and uh, Karam. So UCF 101 consists of 101 uh, class of actions. It's a superset of UCF 50, which itself is a superset of UCF uh, 11. And uh, through, through the day, people explain, uh, will have talked and explain the various aspects of the context. Uh, right now, I just wanted to give people a quick overview Aside, the baseline results for UCF 101 at the start of the contest was around 45%. Uh, but you can see that during the contest, people have really uh, kicked in and uh, achieved very, very high accuracies. Um, what's interesting is that the top few contestants are very, very close together. I mean, just separated by 
you know, point two percent or something. Uh, and we're fortunate to get a lot of the people, uh, at least top five teams, uh, talking about their approaches today. And we'll be able to see some things that are very, very common among these approaches, as well as some very different uh, ideas. Uh, quick overview of the workshop schedule. In the morning, we have uh, invited talks from Cordelia and Jason, and then uh, we'll break into the two parts of the, uh, the challenge, the classification side and the detection. And then the final session, we'll really be looking out towards the future, and in particular, we're very excited to see where the field should go next. I mean, the, the obvious idea would just be to increase the number of classes, but I don't think that's necessarily what the community needs. So please stick around and uh, help us uh, plan out where we'd like the field to go in the future. With that, I'd like to introduce our first invited speaker for the day, Cordelia, who, uh, who's also, I guess, one of the top entrants uh, for the contest. So look forward. Okay, thank you, Robert. <coughs> so I'll start off with presenting actually the results of the challenge. So first of all, what are actions? Actions are can be short actions such as the open hand, the open handshake, or more recently activities such as activities in the non media that actually has it. Okay, and so I'll start off with presenting actually the approach which allowed us to obtain the good excellent results of the challenge. Then I'll a short evaluation of different components for human action recognition, and then I conclude the talk with an approach for modeling human object interactions. Okay, so just what are dense trajectories? Dense trajectories, you sample densely in space feature points, you track them using optical flow, and then you design trajectory, design, uh, trajectory aligned as descriptors, and most importantly, the MDH, which is the difference between optical flow, the different derivatives of optical flow, which allow us to factor out translational camera motion, so it's robust to camera motion. <coughs> However, it is robust to camera motion, but if the camera motion is more complicated, it's still not invariant to this camera motion. And so here, what we have added to the dense trajectories is to prove them by explicitly both estimating camera motion, the approach for estimating camera motion, What's new here is we combine different feature matches, matches to have a dense map to estimate it well. And the second thing that is new is to remove the humans for the estimation because the human actually induces incorrect feature matches. Okay, and here just an overview. We have the flow the human detector, the feature points to calculate the mammography, below the flow, and then on the, on the right, the corrected flow, and the trajectories from the background, which are due to camera motion, which are removed. And so, in more detail, how do we estimate the camera motion? We find correspondences between two consecutive frames. We extract and match surf features, which are relatively robust to motion blur. And then we use, also use the optical flow. We take the most reliable points there, so points which have no information was ever removed. We combine Descriptive surf and inherent surf and with the wedges of case like the optical flow, and then use math friends actually estimate homography. So it's all pretty standard. And here you can see the inline matches of the homography <coughs> for a few examples. Okay, and then if you look here at these two examples, you can see here actually if you don't remove the human before estimating the homography, here that's the the correct optical flow map. <coughs> background motion is not correctly estimated correctly, that's true because you get a lot of feature maps to match that you know, human, which are incorrect, right? And then if you move into your if you move to humans, you can see that actually <coughs> the optical flow, the correct optical flow map really shows the human action and the background action is the background motion is removed. And so here what we show here that is how do we walk the optical flow? We have the and it improves for Hoff because there you really have the camera motion, but it also improves for MBH because the motion distribution is more precise. And then you can remove the background trajectories. And what's interesting here is two examples of failure cases. So if there's motion blurs, motion blurs are not the which are difficult, makes estimation of matching very difficult because then you don't have any correct matches anymore, and then the <coughs> estimation fails. OK, 
Okay, and then here, a short video showing the results. <coughs> so here you see the warped optical flow. <coughs> On the right, the removed trajectories. You can see it's not perfect, but it does generally allow to remove the background motion. So in these cases, the human detector works pretty well. So you get in something which human detector often works well, but in many cases it, I mean, it also fails, right? So it's not something which is completely for terms of these examples. Okay, and then if you look at the results, so what we do, we use the standard setting which we also use for still images. So apply feature vectors. Feature vectors have been shown to perform better, better than features for encoding image statistics or here in this case video statistics. As with feature vectors, we also use power and autonom. Again, that has to show for static images to improve the performance. We also apply square rooting to the initial descriptors, which is again the trick which improves the performance by half a percent. So these are all tri tricks which improve performance by a few percent, but they're all combined all together. It might be important to, be, to advance the descriptors well. We've tested on different data sets, so Hollywood and MB, M, HMBD, etc., and Ludwig Sports. And so here are the results, what can we see? The first row is the dense trajectory features. Different components are there. As you can see, first of all, <coughs> that both correcting the flow and removing the trajectories obviously helps to improve the overall performance. And if you look more closely, you can see that trajectory and Hoff features are significantly improved. So here, for example, with this HMED, you can see here, if you look at the, the Hoff performance, it's improved by here by three or four percent, by ten percent, right? So almost 10%. That's clear if you have optical flow which is not stabilized at all. It's not very representative. If you look at MPH, the improvement <coughs> is significantly smaller, which is nice, which means it has been, it was really robust to camera motion, but of course it cannot handle all types of camera motion. But it's also interesting, the combination of the two together further improves the performance, and that's because one measures the first order the first order statistics and the other one, the second order, so the zero and the first order statistics, right? So they're complementary. And if you look at Hawk, again, intuitively what you want to would expect that there's not much improvement. You can see that here, right? So from the warping you don't gain anything. And from removing the background to the trajectories you have a small gain and that's probably new because you remove some of the unimportant information. <coughs> okay, and then here the comparison. So here we use the combination of not, not the trajectory features, the trajectory features don't help with the combination. So here, the, representing the combination of Hoch, Hoff, and MBH. Here, for dense trajectories, here for the improved trajectories. First of all, we look at the improvement, we compare, compare the improvement for background features and fissure vectors. Here are different data sets. We can see for background feature, feature, bag of features and fissure vectors, the improvement is consistent. So it does actually really help in both cases consistently to remove the camera motion, and what's nice here, you can also see that using the Fisher vectors consistently improves performance as well. So by using Fisher vectors instead of bag of features, we gain two to five percent. And bag of features we do use is not linear kernel, right? So it's not linear as it's in the linear kernel, <coughs> the best settings for visual words, etc. And so, but you can also see that for Olympic sports, where you have large camera motion, the gain is really massive. So here we have a gain of 7%, which is really significant. The smallest gain is for Hollywood, and I guess they're really the, the task of the yeah. <coughs> So for the, for the fact, for the bag of words, if you don't use a chi-square corner, the performance drops by about, let's say, 10%. So there's a really significant drop. And for the feature vectors, you could also use it, obviously, right? And it's a discussion we had the other day with Iman over, over dinner. Anyway, so the feature vectors increase 
is about 1%, one, 1 and the cost is enormous, right? So basically, given that you have this high dimension of the representation, your feature vectors are separable, and if they're separable or almost separable, you don't have a reason not the kernel, right? Yes? Can I square over the plus? No, but you can, no, but no, no, but you can, no, but you can use an adaptive, an adaptive and you can use an equidistant distance, or you can use even, you can project your data to lower dimensions and use a metric, and then use a non kernel. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm sure you can do it, but here, but you agree if you just, features are high dimensional, they're separable, right? I think the fact that they are separable, and as a not learning person, but I think the fact that you are saying that they are separable doesn't mean that they are separable so that they are good by generalized data. Okay, it might generalize better, but if it's completely separable, then you don't need it, right? If you have a, a boundary which is completely clear, then you don't need it, and obviously in practice it's not 100% clear, so actually we did run this experiment once, and was a small gain, so there, okay, it's actually too much maybe for a challenge if you want to win, maybe it's, a, it's <laughs> not here. This could be done, not a, this yeah, I'm on that other step, I'm just curious. No, but it might be some, some idea of tweaking further, but I mean, it's just, it's very, it's very long, right? And this is also where the 100 classes begin, right? If you have 100 classes, you don't want to spend, you don't want to have the training time, which is infinite. Anyway. Okay, for what are I? So basically here, okay, you can see that for, the, I guess the smallest game here, yeah, that's what I say, is for Hollywood, and so MBH is, M H -M -E is not so, so big either. Why is this so? Because A, the, the homography estimation for Hollywood is relatively diff difficult because there are a lot of humans in the foreground and if the human detector fails, or even if there's a small stripe around it, you cannot estimate the homography correctly. I think that's, that's the main reason. Well, for Olympic sports, it's like ideal for this type of techniques. <laughs> You really have a big background and you can really estimate the motion very, very well. And I guess if you see sports, it's kind of similar. Okay, and then here, comparison to the state of the art. So in red, uh, the best results from the state of the art. They're all from CVPR 2013. I don't know if there are any better results at ICC. I've updated it. And then you show the results with and without human detection. And so it's actually nice. You can see consistently for these four data sets, human detection helps. And we have also done in the paper experiment, if you have an, a perfect human detector, the performance sort of increases a bit. So you can gain, it's not massive, but you can gain up to three or four percent by adding this human detector to estimate the motion. So does it slow down? I mean, does it take a lot of time to do all these human detection? Well, the code we, so the code we, look, I come back to that, but I can answer the question. The code we're currently having is like a pretty old version of some code. So it's very slow, so it does slow down massively. And so for our large scale experiments, we're actually not using it today. But I think it's also some, I mean, it has been developed by some other students. So I guess the question would be really, could you do human detection in real time? And I guess it's possible, right? It's something, I mean, it's one of the things I'll come back to that in the conclusion, but I really want to look into improving the human detector. So what we're having right now is not a state of, I mean, it is, I would say, the state of the art is a bit slower. So Yes, 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 yes. Can you repeat the question? Can you repeat the question? So the question is if you suppress multiple humans. Yes, if you suppress multiple humans. So what we do is we have a human detector and then a forward and backward tracker. So we have you have multiple human tracks. And then obviously, as always in vision, there are thresholds and blah, blah. So you have to obviously decide at which point you remove it. And also probably do something more probabilistic that you give higher and lower weights depending on the human response. It's something also we're not doing. We're doing right now, and we're also not using the human detector. It's also something you could do <coughs> using the human detector to fuse further weight your features. Right, right now it's just used to estimate the homography, but you could also use it to read the actions to really say that things which lie on the humans have a higher weight. Okay, and then so this is just to come back to the challenge results. So here we use the improved trajectory features plus feature vector. So what I've presented so far, we don't use a human detector due to computational cost. Obviously, if we had had enough time, we could have run it, but we just ran that after the CPR deadline, and there was like two days to run the whole experiment. So they're actually running very fast. Can we hit a knob and in two days the results come out, except for the human detection. And what my student added was the spatial <coughs> So uh -huh. spatial temporal pyramid to embed the structure information. So again, that again to 100%. And I mean, it could, it could work, but given that the, the 
layout of the actions are pretty different, we found that it's not something which improves the performance, performance significantly. Okay, and then we've also used the same approach in the track read multimeter event detection challenge. I'll just use this final show of the results. So what they're having there, one, one class is making sandwich, and this is the first, so if you rank all the results for the, for the class making sandwich, this is the highest ranked one, and then this is ranked 20. And so all the ones between one and 20, they're correct. So what's actually nice is the first, the first highest ranked ones, they're all correct. So even if the performance is not that good, the best ones are all ranked correctly. And so that's nice if you look at the results, they're usually very appealing. And then <coughs> yeah, if you look at the first incorrect results, that's actually interesting. <coughs> and it's pretty clear why it's incorrectly classified, right? Because so, so in this one, you didn't do the homography. We do the homography, but not the human detection. So again, for track there, there it's really too slow, right? So there, you have, you must know better, but 12,000 hours, I think, of video, and they're really already to extract the features and estimate the homography. The homography estimation and the feature extraction code we have now running very fast. So that's actually running well, but the human detection is not. So, so that helps also in the Yes, yes, yes. We just, we kind of are now doing exactly, so this year what we did, we, we added that and it gave us a few percent, right? So again, it gives three to four percent for, for track base. So it's all, it's pretty consistent actually, so among the different data sets. But it's, it's not clear that, that it's person detection you really care about in track base. You really care about foreground motion removal. Like this is a hand here that's getting in the way. And the track videos are quite more uh, sort of open source than the action of recognition. Yeah, you're saying it might not be. So I hear another example for flash mob gathering. So again, you can see the first, the highest ranked ones, they're all correct. <coughs> it's true if you think of a human detector there, it's really difficult, right? Yeah, so, yeah. But there are, there are actually actions also where you could help, right? So for example, if you have grooming an animal, so there you have one person performing an action, okay, then you should like to go further and do something with the other objects, which is action as well. Okay, and then the last, the first incorrect example is it's just a background video again, and you can see that here again, it's very similar in humans moving together, but instead of doing a flash mob gathering and moving to one point, you're just randomly moving around the canvas. It's pretty clear where the confusion comes from. Okay, and so this was the first part of my talk, and the next part, so what we have also looked at recently is evaluation of different components for human action recognition. So if you look at the different steps <coughs> of human action recognition, you have first the flow estimation, that is you can clustering and then ideally you could also add high level features. And so here this would be the real optical flow and this would be the perfect optical flow and the perfect masks and the perfect high level features. And so what we have done, we have taken coming. We have taken so 21 actions from from the HMPD data set. So one of the authors of the uh, original data set took over from this paper. We have selected a set of clips. The clips are so a bit shortened, it contain 30,000 frames. For each of these frames, we have annotated the human, the human puppet, so you have actually the human outline. And so this gives you obviously the puppet mask, the puppet joints, and for the flow, you suppose that the flow between body parts is constant. So that gives you an estimation of the flow. Okay. And then basically you have the estimation of the flow, you have this puppet flow. And then you can look, so here, baseline would be without the change of the trajectory, because the trajectory features is not the motion corrected version. Then here are the results. If you had perfect optical flow, you would gain about 
that here similarly, if you just had the mask, no perfect optical flow, but you have a perfect mask, again, you can gain about 10%, so that would be if you had a perfect lumen detector. And then here, if you use the high level features of the joints information you have from the joints, then you get a 20% improvement. So if you had a perfect human pose detector, then you would get this 20%. So 2D joint position, not 3D. Yeah, yeah, we have no way of getting it. So compared to just to your supply to human infection, not this uh, more complex operating model, then you don't get that much improvement? Well, here, so for the mid level features, we have combined, we have compared using the bounding box and using the puppet mask, right? <coughs> so that's in the paper. And you can show that basically using the bounding box, you get a bit less, but it's similar to the mask, right? So if you have the 3D joint position, you get a few points. Yeah, can you The mask is just, just what you do is you just mask, you mask the image information and then you just take the standard pipeline, right? And you just extract on this mask, which not the image you extracted it. Just, just right? standard human detection. Masking, standard human detection. Standard 
you were detected or a zero, zero is implication, and then you just apply the standard. So the question here is like, what component, I mean, what would help most, right? It's kind of how much helps what? And so here you just mask out the initial information, and you just apply the dense optical flow, right? I mean, the dense trajectory code as is. But I guess the, the comment is more that there, there's more information in the mask than there is in the pose, right? So it's probably dependent on the features you're using. Like for example, you said that you can't tell someone brushing their hair from probably petting a dog or something like that. With the pose. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but you could okay, with the mask. The, the mask, the mask is used just as a mask, as a, yeah. like as a, not as a, a silhouette description. You could obviously have a silhouette description on that, right? But yeah. here it's just used to like to take either the bounding box around the human to, make, to just take those features inside there, or you make yeah. more refined bounding box. But it's not at all. You're not extracting. Okay, so five minutes. Um, so yes, we have seen that. Um, so we have to improve current. So what do we have to do? We have to improve current optical flow algorithms. So the, we have also done a preliminary innovation with different state-of-the-art algorithms. And actually, what's interesting is that the, the better algorithms for optical flow are not necessarily better for action recognition. So probably they perform a lot of oversmoothing. It's actually interesting. Did several experiments, it just doesn't help to use, for example, the box and money. And no, and here in this paper, there's another example which does even more smoothly the performance drops by two I mean, I don't know if you how relevant it is, we have to do more experiments, but it's it's clear that the current optical flow techniques are actually not they're not doing what we want for actions. And I guess also what you want for actions is that you, you have this relatively small limbs and if you do a more smoothly way, you just get rid of everything, which is significant, right? And then basically using the most basic algorithm, which is the, opti the, the optical flow profile back which is the OCD, gives actually results which are reasonable. And then second thing, I guess it's time now to move towards integrating using human detection and those estimation for edge recognition. And so again, we've done a very small experiment on a subset of, <coughs> of actions where the actor is fully visible and apply the young rather and pose algorithm and actually there we show that it improves performance by a few percent. This kind of shows that if we manage to improve the goals out of estimation a bit further, we're really there and can we use it now to improve the actual recognition. Okay, how much time? Just like Okay, then I just <laughs> I just end with one video which I like. So this is kind of going into the direction that we need. You know, it's not really okay, this is Okay, so anyway, so the video Okay, so this is just to conclude basically, like undermines the point that basically you should move away from just modeling the action, but you have to have also the interaction with the environment and the object. And I guess you have to move towards techniques which are relatively precise, right? So instead of just having a very crude context model, which is just a bag of features, you really want to have the interaction with the cup and then you know the guy is drinking. And this, and then you also can go further and spend a larger space because you can say interaction with the cup or a pen. If you think it's really that the same thing, it can make a difference, right? Okay, thank you for your attention. A couple of uh, questions. So I know people are interrupting you all the time. It's fine. Did you see mm -hmm. a one on one? Did not use or did you use the human detection and the mammography? We use the mammography always, and we don't, okay. and we didn't use the human detection. We just time constraints because we had to run it in a day or two of the CPR deadline. So I guess it would be interesting now because if you have time, you can run it, right? Even if it's slow, it's not in the data set.
So, so you think you can improve it for that if you use the more detection? Well, I would, I mean, it would be interesting. So basically, for all the other examples, I showed that we gain like two, let's say two percent, and if you gain two percent, it would be I mean, significant, right? If you look at the yeah, the, the, the 0.2% differences, so I guess 100% would make a big difference. Yeah, yeah, and even if it's just 1%, it would make a difference, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Slide four. Yeah. 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 What do you mean if you only have the upper body? Yes, uh, uh, no, some, some kind of smaller than upper body because of the you only have the face. So, so the human detector we are having is actually, it detects different components. It detects the face, the upper body, and the full body. Okay, and so it's a combination. Mark, mark it's do you use a mark for detector? Or mark for detector? Multiple detectors? Yeah, multiple detectors. Yes, yes, yes. You have four, four components. Thank you very much, please thank the speaker. Our next invited talk is by Jason Corso from Buffalo. And, uh, he'll, be, uh, he'll be talking about a variety of things. Yes, sir. But not limited to their entry into the contest. Uh, I can say that in 30 seconds. We ran Action Bank <laughs> from UCF 50. We, we didn't have the time to really invest in the, in the competition. I do apologize for that, but uh, I'll talk about some other things, or some related things, yes. including books, actually. So, uh, right, I'm glad to be here, thanks very much. Uh, so, in the spirit of the workshop, this talk will be uh, about what doesn't work, or what didn't work for us, actually. Uh, I think that will be useful, uh, and POTUS is included in there. Although, if you do fuse POTUS with action recognition like that trajectory, you do see a 3% or so improvement, like, but, uh, so uh, that'll take up maybe half the, the talk, maybe a, a third of the talk, and then I'll, I'll, I'll supplement it with uh, what I think has a lot of promise, which is sort of the shape of the action for uh, segmentation. And we've, we've carried out a, a human uh, psycho <coughs> psychophysics study uh, on some segmentation videos that show uh, there's quite a bit of information about not only the action, but also the actor in the, in the material. Okay, so uh, the first part is about closing motion. And uh, if I can begin by just kind of asking you a little bit uh, some questions, right? So you all know the UCF 50 classes. Uh, what action is this? Drumming? Diving. Diving? 